this is called open mic for the disenfranchised. I'm an open mic gypsy. We're the wannabes, the almost famous, the has been famous, the never going to be famous. We're the next wave, the new wave. For some of us, it's going to be an endless wave. We'll show up for the opening of a new bodega. You'll give us five minutes and a microphone. Open mic is our training wheels, it's our mistress, and it's our siren's call. Who are we? We're that aging Mulberry Street Guinea comic whose jokes now mock the Guido Sopranos Jersey Shore white beater t-shirt image of himself. He's so carefully constructed and played out for most of his life. We're that radical swathmore lesbo who chooses to protest now without words or signs displaying her flawless porcelain body and burlesque reviews that ridicule our obsession with fame and sexuality while titillating male tourists' imagination with the possibility of wonders that are never going to be. We're that English with PhD, bullied by the kids of his block for being an uppity nigger too smart for his own damn good. Well, now he's relentlessly rapping and slamming his truths on open mic with no apologies and no regrets. And in your fucking face, brother. We're the second generation freckled mix singing songs of rebellion and anarchy to comrades in an Irish homeland that only seems real now on a drunken St. Patty's Day. We're that skateboarding middle-class Jap kid who grew up on the Beatles and rock and roll, wants to put his own mark on our music, but he's got to work at his mom's sushi joint till that happens. With the lapsed Catholic ex altar boy, too damaged for any real relationship. His poems cry out his loss of faith after being irreverently probed as a child by his parish priest. With the self educated beater bus boy, studying English and writing poems on a park bench, who dreams in rain of becoming a real waiter someday and replacing that pretty white girl who smiles enticingly at him while steering part of their shared tips to feed her habit. With the Afghan war burnout who traded bullets and IEDs for shots of heroin and Jameson to ease the pain while writing diaries of a love lost in Ohio and drifting off into combat nightmares at AA meetings. With a gifted Israeli artist who, unmarried, unapologetic, and rejected by her community for the crime of being single and female at 40, she now blesses the locals here with tattoos of exquisite beauty and a joyous song of a new love with that dropout fag college student from Levittown who didn't fit his parents' expectations of who he was supposed to be, but who fits perfectly into a slinky lame cocktail gown and stilettos for a stand-up routine and turns tricks on the side for more money than his father makes in a month. We're the Hasidic Jew boy, dropped acid, trekked the Himalayas, and became a Buddhist monk, spilling out saffron rap poems of beauty and oneness on street corners for passers-by who never listen. With a pimple-faced kid from the burbs escaping a boring, tedious life popping oxy from her mom's medicine cabinet until she leaves home to come down here and sing her story. Or the New Eureka street boy from Avenue B who graffitis his way into showings of prominent village galleries, raps his shit on open mic, and gets to fuck a beautiful blonde white girl from Minneapolis, which is all they ever really wanted to do. We're here at z -Ball. In that story on open mic, that door is the line in the sand. You cross it and you take your chances because you're in my world now. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, from our What the Hell is Love show. There's a few people here that were in our What the Hell is Love show. A few graduates. Uh, it's called What the Hell is Love, coincidentally. Wow. I'm six years old. I know one thing for sure. I love my mother. At eight, I really love my dog, Penny. At 12, I think I love Jesus. At 14, I love Maureen, but she likes my best friend. At 16, I'm in love with Cass, but I'm dating her best friend. At 18, I'm just angry. I think nobody loves me. I hate everybody. At, at 21, really, Rosie really loves me, but for almost a year, I was too drunk to notice that she was a hooker. And, and too drunk to care, because I, I don't think I really loved her. At 23, I'm madly in love with Carol. We even got engaged until she dumped me at 25, when I confessed I really wanted to be an actor and not the middle-class banker that I had promised her. I, I, I was being selfish, but I was still heartbroken. At 26, Sharon and I are deeply in love, but she tortures me with flirtations and endless tests to prove that I love her. After three years of fights, anxiety, and exhaustion, I just quit loving her. <laughs>
It's then she chooses to become the woman I thought I originally fell in love with, but hey, it's too late, it's over. She asked me if we could at least be fuck buddies. I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> at 30, I'm in love with Eileen, but it's the onset of women's liberation. She weighs our relationship in terms of what her women's support group feels of, as appropriate. She dumps me because they tell her I'm too sexist, not a sensitive enough guy. She leaves a party message on my answering machine saying, thank you, you helped me grow. <laughs> grow what, a dick? Thank you, how's that for sensitive? At 32, I'm living with Susan. She's a free spirit. She feels that an open sexual relationship is necessary to fulfill herself as a woman. So she runs off to Canada to live in a teepee with some hippie, and she leaves her needy sister behind in my apartment till I work up the courage to kick her out. I slept with a lot of women during the summers of free love. I didn't have a lot of fun, and I got to clap three times. A friend offers a telecomservation. <laughs> Thank you. Been there, done that. Thank God for St. Mark's Free Clinic. A friend, a, a friend offers a telling observation. You know, all the women you think you fall in love with are really the same fucked up person. They just look different. Wow. A moment of clarity here, huh? She offers me a blind date with her best friend to prove her point. And, and I actually believe I feel real love for the very first time. But she's gone now, so here I am, 42 years later, and I find myself still wondering, what the hell is love? And I realize now I may never know. The feeling seems now a more an abstraction than a tangible sensation. At this late stage of my life, I feel like I know as little about love as when I started out. I'm very grateful for all the love I've been given, but I honestly have no real feeling for how much I ever returned. Thank you. This is, this is uh, from my um, Barfly show called Playing Picasso. It's late. I'm sitting alone at the bar working on my fourth double jack. I'm feeling pretty mellow. She leans across two seats, taps me on the shoulder, stares me dead in the face, and slurs out. You look just like Pablo Picasso. <laughs> she, she's really pretty. I guess late 30s, early 40s, sculpted cheekbones, a great body packed in tight black leather. Her hair is long and straight and dyed black with bangs almost covering those haunted, crazy eyes. It's always the woman I fall in love with at a bar late at night. Pablo Picasso, yeah, I bet you get that all the time, huh? No, not really. <laughs> She spots my fancy camera on the bar. Hey, you're a photographer, right? I say sometimes, mostly I tell stories. She flashes a Cheshire cat grin. Hey, me too. And she drifts off into some rambling drug story with a couple of lame attempts at being funny. You know, everything you say seems to have like a sardonic twist at the end, like a comedian or something. She smiles up at me suggestively. Well, I am a comedian. Really? What kind of comedy do you do? She says, Dada. A Dada comedian. Really? Come on. Could she be that hip? I don't think so. She says, what kind of comedy do you do? I repeat, I'm not a comic. I tell stories. She coyly replies, well, I'll bet my stories are a hell of a lot more interesting than yours. As she slowly starts moving her face and her lips in close to an attack position, I said, hey, wait, I got a Speedo at home that's older than you. She dusts me, <laughs> she dusts me off. I'll bet my stories are a hell of a lot more interesting than yours. You ever done crack? Uh, no, I stopped at mix, messing and speed. Obviously, you didn't. And she kind of goes my comment. Well, well, what comedians do you like? I, I don't know. Richard Pryor, Andy Kaufman, Sarah Silverman. You know, everybody thinks I am Sarah Silverman. Really? Actually, I can see that with the... Uh, Enough drinks in me in a dark bar. She does look a little like Sarah Sullivan. And Andy Kaufman was my hero. He was my role model. She rests her hand on my thigh. My Cialis instantly kicks in, telling my body I'm 40 years old again. And Jack, and Jack Daniels has whispered in my head, hey, go for it, man. You could do this. She seems pretty intelligent. She's somewhat creative, very pretty. 
very sexy, very fucked up. <laughs> Just my kind of girl. <laughs> I give her my card and I invite her to my next show. <laughs> why do they still entice me, these beautiful, intelligent crazies? And why do they still seek me out? Do they still see the leftover crazy in these old eyes past the wrinkled face and the beat up shit? I, 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 I got carried away. Leftover in these old eyes and past the wrinkles in the beat up face. I was still back at the Cialis line there. <laughs> Shouldn't she be able to see in me that it doesn't work? I've got the scars from battles lost with crazy drugs and booze. I'm living proof. And more important, why do I feel this incredible emotional and sexual magnetism here? It's an old feeling. It feels good. I really like it. Is it just a Jack Daniels and the Seattle's purely a chemical reaction? I don't think so. I know better, but still, I want to throw her in the back of a 60 Triumph Bonneville race off to some cheap motel and make hard bandit love to her. We're crazy. That's what we do, ain't it? Feel bad tomorrow, right? We're both losers, you know. <laughs> Heading for a Bonnie and Clyde ending here. Pablo Picasso, Sarah Silverman. Two fucked up souls, irreversibly driving into a head-on, dead-on collision. She leans in and she hugs me way too tight, and I, I feel myself wanting a lot more, but once in a while, age actually brings little bits of wisdom into your head at the last moment. And I grab my camera and I start heading for the door and I hear her yelling behind me, Hey Pablo, why are you leaving, man? I've been in the same sad movie way too many times. And I ain't hanging around for the bad ending on this one. Thank you. And here's our preview for the Losers Club. We got three Losers Club ladies here, right? Thank you, ladies. Uh, I joined the Losers Club in the summer of 1954, before everyone here was born, I'm sure. Until then, I'm this beautiful, relatively innocent young kid, an altar boy, honor student, teacher's pet, and I'm working on a scholarship to St. Joe's Prep. But hormones have a way of kicking in and fucking with you just when things are going good. My dick is hard all the time. I break out of a, a fury of technicolor acne with small volcanoes of melting cheese leaking out. It's fucking disgusting, even to me. Well, wet dreams, constant sexual fantasies, and frequent masturbation are my only outlet. Until I discover alcohol and dancing. Fueled by Seagram 7, I gained a reputation as a great fast dancer, what we used to call jitterbugging back then. I win every dance contest I ever enter, but I can't get a date to save my life, and no one will ever snow dance with me. I stared longingly at couples dancing to those slow doo-wop love songs. My heart aches, the shirelles, the Andrews, and the hearts, the platters. Makes me want to cry. That ain't an option for a punk-ass guinea kid in South 50, Philly in the 50s. I'm always sad and lonely. I want somebody to love me like in those doo-wop songs. It just ain't happening. I'm 14. What the fuck? This sucks. <laughs> All I really want to do is fit in. I can't seem to figure out how everybody does it. I watch the school jocks, yearbook staff, prom kings, prom queens, chicks with letters, sweaters, cool, pitiful free guys who seem to attract women like magnets. My sadness simmers until it finally boils up as anger. And that's something I think I can deal with. I see that movie, The Wild One with Marlon Brando. I identify immediately with those bandit bikers. A second-hand store provides me with a leather motorcycle jacket and engineer boots, and I slick back my hair with Vaseline petroleum jelly. I can't afford the real stuff. But in the summer, it gets hot, and that shit melts and leaks down my face and my neck, so trying to look dangerous ain't working so good for me either. But I, I did succeed in getting kicked out of Catholic school. I'm eventually forced to accept the fact that I'm part of that group of pimple-faced rejects, gims, greasers, tomboys, chubbies, nerds, geeks, flat-chested chicks, kids who read too much, sissies, and boys who suck at sports. I'm a fucking loser. But in the long run, it turns out to be a good thing, really. I cover my wounds with whiskey and books, which eventually leads to writing. Totally immersed in books, I discovered that feeling weird, excluded, and ex rejected has produced a lot of really good writers. So, hey, 
I submerge myself in Kerouac and the other beat writers of the day. And I leave home at 18 to join the beat pilgrimage on the road searching for self-discovery and the meaning of life. You know, turns out to be a hell of a long ride on a damn bumpy road. Ten years later, 1969, I'm on the hippie trail to the promised land, the East Village, New York City. I'm home. Looking back at it all, it had to happen just that way. For me to come, what I was meant to be all along, a downtown writer-performer. We're mostly Losers Club alumni down there, and I'm doing it, I fit in just fine. Tour buses take those old frat boys and cheerleaders down there to gawk at us. We stare back. Thankful we never became the dull-eyed, bloated, middle-class suburban robots they turned into. Their peacock lives peaked at 18, and they now resemble fat, waddling pigeons. Our fledgling days took a lot more time, but hey, look at us. We became swans. Ain't that the ultimate revenge of the nerds? Thank you.